all these different things. So you, you really do have to pick and choose on, on what you care for. But, but on that end, you say you've been there 15, 20 years, and it's looked great, and suddenly it's, you know, you're starting to see signs of stress. Well, trees get bigger again, and you know, the, 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 the branches that we see are not always that important to the tree. Sometimes the tree is going to say, you know what, you've done a great job for me the last 50 or 60 years, but you're in the shade and you're not cutting it. You're not pulling your weight, so you're fired. And they're going to concentrate the resources way up top at the expense of those. So sometimes it's just a normal you know, uh, competition within the canopy. Yes, to lose lower branches because lower branches are shaded out by what's above. So you're going to concentrate on what's producing the food for you. It's a real simple concept. It's called put out or get out. So you have the upper part of the tree is producing food. Those lower branches are shaded. And so you're going to abandon them because they're not productive. My upper branches are the ones that are getting brown, and they're in the sun all the time. But then that's a serious issue. And that's, there that's should more be, serious, yeah. yeah. I've got a comment that pertains to, I'm, I'm not an expert on, on the types of trees, but this pertains to what I call long needle pines, mature long needle pines, not the Colorado blue spruce okay. or the uh, uh, cypress. Or the gotcha. Yeah, pines. But, uh, I've been here 18 years, and I started out with at least 30 or more big, mature long needle pines, and I was losing at least two or three a year, and about six years ago, uh, I got down to about six trees left. Oh, wow. And just like you said earlier, they, they're going to die. I, I would tell everyone, well, they, they, these trees just self-destruct. They get so big, and all of a sudden they turn brown and they're gone. You've got to take somebody to take them out. But what I started doing was I got an, uh, an insect killer from Home Depot and a two-gallon sprayer, and, uh, you know, very inexpensive, and it only takes about an hour at the most to do this when you're talking about six trees. But I, in the spring, when you said April, that's when I, when the buds first come out, I, I with a with a good insect killer, I spray about six or eight feet up, just that far, no higher, just the trunk of the pine. Yeah. And then I do it again in the middle of the summer, and I do it again in the in the fall, three times a year. It costs about ten bucks a year worth of insect spray. But I won't, uh, over those six years, I've only lost one tree. So it's, Yeah, but you've also something. thinned your trees out a lot because basically there's not that much stuff walks up and down the trunk in that area. So well, you, can you see may have lost enough tree. trees that your pressure from so many trees is reduced. But, you know, I, uh, it's, it's not something that I would recommend, at least not through Michigan State University, because it doesn't have any scientific value that you could prove. If it works for you and you like to do it, that's okay. Well, you may be you may be controlling the uh, black turpentine beetle because it attacks at that level. Well, I can see the holes in the tree. So okay. You, and, and I, when you show when they're the dead, right? Pardon? When the trees die, you can see the holes. Yeah, and, and you and you can see the sap sometimes. Not every year, but you can see that. This is a dangerous thing. If you see a tree that's dead and you observe holes on it. If a tree dies, there are other insects that are called secondary or, or tertiary pests. They come in and they attack a dead tree. They feed off the dead tree. There are, there are certain suspects on living trees that attack and are, are uh, pathogenetic on living trees. But then after the tree dies, then you can have things coming in. And so sometimes the mistake is made that, okay, this tree is dead. It's got holes in it. Whatever did these holes kill the tree? It's prob it, it may be, but more often than not, it's not the case. It's a secondary uh, beetle, maybe like a powder post beetle or something else. Or your pine sawyers. Or your pine sawyers that come in and, and they take advantage of the dead trees. So you have to be very careful about self-diagnosis. Or like you say, they're going to die anyway, so it's going to happen after about 20 years. The other thing is, if you look at the population curve of trees over time, the, the populations of young trees is like this, and then over time, it goes down, 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 until you get to the very old age classes, and there's only a few members. That's a natural process. That's a very normal thing. For trees 
and the tree it's very competitive they can't just get up and leave when it gets tough you know I, I used to take care of a lot of Ford engineers you know their properties I don't have any left I don't think yes Are you gonna speak to the umbrellas, uh, issue? I can speak to that briefly um, and I can too go ahead can you repeat okay. the question, please? Yeah, he's going to talk about uh, Imprellus. He wants to know about Imprellus, which is a material that was used last year on lawns produced by DuPont. We would have had to hire a company to do it. It killed weeds, but we had tremendous rains in the spring, and it moved it from the location that it was put in or possibly was misused by some companies, and a lot of evergreens died, some deciduous died. But they would have they would have been in trouble last year. They wouldn't have waited for this year to be in trouble. Yeah. So in Prelice damage, it was usually a one-time application. It worked very well for what it was supposed to do on the turf. But the long-term research, I guess, wasn't done or was missed. Uh, Nobody thought it was going to rain eight inches in a month. So so it, it migrated and moved to off-target organisms, which is a is a you know it's just collateral damage. So what's happened is is it's affected white pines spruces, uh, Norways, even blue spruces, and there's, there's other tree species that it has affected. Some deciduous, yeah. So if you had impellus damage on your property that was applied by a professional, that professional should have contacted you to say, oops, you know, we applied this, nobody knew this was going to happen, it's really not their fault because they heavily marketed it, the EPA signed on and approved it, and then once there was damage that was found associated with it, they pulled it very quickly. But by that time, millions of trees have been affected. And so the, the process, very quickly, the lawn care company that applied in Prellis um, or DuPont has, should have sent a representative to Already. grade your trees as to the degree of damage. They take that information. They go to their claims department that they've set up and they they come back with a monetary package to take care of trees either cut them down or to you know do some of the you know fertilization or insect and disease management because they've been stressed but, but, they, but they're also not going to replace a 60 foot tree because I had somebody call and they were having a temper tantrum because DuPont refused to replace a 60 foot tree you can't they can't move them that big. Unless you're Disney World. Yeah. You know, that's why they don't drag Shamu the whale all over the country. Too big. Yeah. Jeremy, yes. uh, yeah. Austrian pines are probably the worst tree right now that you could plant because it's susceptible to all these diseases. And Everything has plant. its problems. Well, what yeah. about some other varieties? What about hemlock or fir? If you're going to support, you know, replace a tree, why would you go back and put an Austrian pine in? Because we well, have it Austrian make pine any all sense, over no. this subdivision and they're all dying. Right. Yeah, well, and that ought to be a message. You know about what they talk about, the definition of insanity. You keep doing the same thing over and over and getting the same results. Yeah. Well, obviously, if you're having trees die, what you do is you take a look at them. Like Jeremy said, they're all going to have some problems. Some have bigger problems than others. So you can, you can look at hemlocks. There's a hemlock woolly adelgid that's a problem north of us. Eventually it might come here. It's an insect that affects the needles on the tree. You know, it may or may not come here, but in a, if you only got one or two trees, you can treat it. Uh, you could look at firs. So another, I wouldn't look at Douglas fir because they're having a lot of problems right now with Swiss needle cast. But I mean, you could look at con color, you could look at Fraser. But you gotta have the right conditions. I showed that thing about what the right conditions were. So what you do is you check. I'm not gonna buy a tree until I know what my conditions are. Because when he was talking about the big trees that live forever, they've got the perfect growing conditions. The farther you are from what they need, the shorter their life is gonna be. So why does one tree live to be, you know, like the Hardwick pines, why did they live so long? They got some really good growing conditions up there with the soil and the temperature and everything else. If you're talking about Monroe County, they might not have done the same thing down there. So when you pick something, how much problem, potential problem does it have? But look at your site, assess your site, 
find out what the soil is like, and then make changes if you need to do it. Otherwise, they will not adapt to the site. Okay, one last question from me. When you plant a tree, they give you a ball. They've got this steel mesh growing around. The basket. Plus yeah. a burlap. Mm -hmm. Some guys leave everything in. Some people take out the metal and split the burlap out. What's your choice of plant? How do you do that? And what level do you put that tree? Um, you know, there, there are standards of care that we have as arborists. And the, the, if you have a metal basket, it should be removed. Get it out. If you can. If, if you can. Nothing now, else, you're cutting away as much of the top as possible. Top third at least. Yeah. <clears throat> and the reason why is that that's where you're going to have most of your root growth in the top third, moving out. Um, burlap, again, top third. But I tell you what, I go, if, if, if there's a tree that's been planted two to four years ago and it's failing, probably 80% of the time, you go, I look at the tree, I go like this, I look at the, the root flare, and it usually goes straight in or it tapers. That's and then if I look, I can still see the twine. And it was never removed. The, the installation people never told the homeowners to remove it after a year. And, and really, it should have been done at the time of planting. So that's one of those things where like it's human error. Consequently, I see the same thing with staking. I'm not a big fan of tree staking, simply because it never gets removed in a timely fashion. I, I, I see it all the time where there's been an Austrian pine or there's been a spruce or something. And, and you put it in a, in a condition where it's windy and it's good to have trees for, as windbreaks. That's, you know, a utilitarian thing that you can plant trees for, which is good. But once the tree establishes after one to two years, you've got to remove the staking because it will damage the tree. It also prevents it from rooting well because if you stake it so tightly that it doesn't move at all, it thinks it's just fine. It doesn't grow any roots. They're not real smart. So by having it just a little bit loose so there's a tiny bit of movement, it grows those roots. So the tighter you stake it, the more you're preventing it from doing that job of making roots. So when you get that tree, it goes in the ground at grade. You don't sit it above, you don't sink it below. If you have to raise it above, it needs to be a reason why. This location is too wet. Well, is it going to be good if you have a lot of rains? Is it going to be too wet at that point? But then you have to slope soil away from the ball. Don't add a bunch of amendments to the hole because the hole will hold moisture differently than all your soil. So you got clay. Oh, and I made this beautiful mixture of peat moss and black soil. You've heard all these. And dumps it in the hole. And what happens is when you water it, it turns into chocolate pudding sitting in a clay bowl and the tree drowns in its own juices. So you want to put the soil back in that came with. If you're compelled, you're going to have neurotic fits if you don't do something. Don't add more than a third of whatever you want to add to that hole. Do not fertilize that tree at the time of planting, especially with nitrogen. Because if you go and throw a bunch of fertilizer on it, nitrogen is a soluble salt, and it will pull the moisture out of those roots. And once they become desiccated, they're pretty much root jerky. That's it. They don't ever come back. <laughs> your slide earlier where you had mulch. Yeah. Given a lot of your slides dealt with fungus and insects, you said organic mulch, but is like cedar better than hardwood, better than cypress? in terms of, you know, not getting insects or... Fungi. You know, cedar is supposed to be a little bit um, ant repellent. So, you know, it, it may be like the first two weeks that you put it down, but the, the you know, the... I, I've seen insect, you know, I've seen ants in cedar mulch. And so, so basically, it, it's all, you know, the look. You know, okay, what so is the look that you want? Okay. Because diseases are not going to come with the mulch. And I think that on my acreage, I put in probably 200 and some cedar fence posts. That was going to be so cool for my fence for the horses. And when I took them up 30 years later, they looked like pencil points. And the ants were living in those things by the billion. So the cedar fence posts didn't repel anybody. I just spent a bunch of money because I thought it was going to work. Thank you. Desmond, did you have anything? Yep. 
Uh, we have a fairly large lot, and uh, I've got 80 to 90 significant trees on the property. Uh, we don't have an inch of grass on the whole property. I've lost one significant tree in the last 12 or 13 years. But water and irrigation seems to be important because I, I planted some one plump dogwood and three regular dogwoods, you know, in different locations. The clump dogwood is only in the sun half the day. And I noticed a few years ago, after it had been planted, it all just came out, bloomed beautifully, you know, and there it was, it was growing. And then it started, the, the green leaves started doing what you said the dogwood did to get the brown circle. You know, right? And a tree man said, well, you just got to give it more water. So I did. I gave her a lot more water and water. Next year, same thing, and the tree looked worse. So I said, well, more water, right? So I did. I put in an irrigation system which made sure it got water. In 30 minutes a day, there was no spray, but surface irrigation. And this year, it was beautiful. I mean, the blooms were better than they were ever before. And it even started some fresh new green growing, you know, on the top of the plump dog. Mm -hmm. But here, about a month ago, all the lower leaves, you know, under the new ones, still got the brown circles around them. And when and you I, say brown circles, I, is, uh, is, the, is the branch leading to those old leaves uh, just restricted so much it, it just can't grow? Because the top green ones, the new leaves, no. they're just as beautiful and green as ever. Well, the, the new leaves have escaped the early spring rains, so that could be an infection period. What I think he probably has is uh, either septoria leaf spot or maybe dogwood anthracnose. I would vote for anthracnose. It'd be, you, you, what you have is called Cornus florida, and that's the native dogwood, which is good from here, uh, from uh, Canada all the way to Florida practically. If it's Cornus, Florida, they get dogwood anthracnose big time. Yeah, but what about the new leaves being? They came general? out after the disease happened. So those yeah. new guys, the older leaves got it, but you had new growth come on. The disease was no longer active, so they didn't get it. Well, or if or it's not active, why are the lower leaves all brown around the edge? Let me scorched. ask you, how is it watered? A spray. It's overhead? Yeah. Water goes down just for 30 minutes. Are the lower are those lower limbs contacted by the water? Not all of it, no. Okay. No, no, they the, the sprinkler is a lower level. It's a lower level? Well, what happens is it's a catch twenty two. You what? water, it's a catch twenty two. Because sometimes when you water, you create a nice human environment that the fungi like to grow in. And so what'll happen is you'll get spores that are able to float and stay aloft longer in a higher humidity situation. You know, next time you start to see that brown, or I'll stop by and take it's a there look. right now. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come by and take a look, because I, I can look at the leaf, look at the pattern of damage, and I'll be able to tell you exactly what it is. Yeah, and I guess the other thing well, is why don't the green ones, ones do it? Why don't the green ones? Green leaves, yeah. Because they're at the top and they're drying off faster. They're in the direct they're sun. Smaller, they're, growing, they're, in the, they're healthier. They're in, they're, at the top, they're usually there's more wind and there's more sun. Down below, there's less wind and less sun. Therefore, the leaves stay wet for an extended period of time, which allows them to become infected. So all things fungal. I mean, if we can go back to uh, look at uh, Dr. Strom out here. See? See how it's worse in the lower? Up here, where it's nice and green, you got more sun and more wind. So I think a similar infection uh, hierarchy is happening. And that's why Rhizospera starts on the lower part of the tree. It's older, it stays damper, there's branches closer to the ground, more humidity. Yeah, but next spring, it'll all be nice and green, the tree will be green and beautiful huh. for about two, three months, and then bang. Because it takes time for the infection period to... Uh, they, they're not born infected. Fulfill. Yeah. It takes time. So it, it's easily correctable. That's the good news. How do you correct it? Uh, you have to do either control the irrigation or fungicide. What do you mean control the irrigation? Less irrigation? Uh, not less irrigation, just the method of delivery. 
I would on say, the ground. I would say uh, I'm a big fan you of soccer. Better put in a, 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 well, a drip, like you do with a, a, a drip type of irrigation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you got to do more than just water the trunk. Because a lot of times drips don't do a lot. Spread around. I've got to cover an area ten feet by ten feet. Okay. Yeah, as long as you can get that whole area damp. Yeah. But it is now. Yeah. But the water's going up in the air. No, the no, 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 no. This is a low. The sprinkler doesn't go more than two feet above the ground. Yeah, but water's still spraying up where drip is in the ground or under your mulch. That's the difference between water going into the air and staying in the mulch. You want to use a drip? Then? <laughs> well, it's going to give you less moisture in the air. With well, human air, it doesn't help, but you don't want to add to it. I'll come back next year. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. It will probably, <laughs> unless we have uh, a drought that starts in April. Yes. Dry. <coughs> Besides hugging the Japanese maple, <laughs> this leaves, but it did relief. Yeah. But is there anything to do? It doesn't need a boost of anything for, to prepare for the winter. Well, not now. Not yeah. Now. What, what what I what I like to do is make sure that you water, uh, and in the a good rule of thumb is after a hard frost. I mean a really hard frost. So, so you know, you really have to baby those because here's what happens. You kind of just are status quo, and I've seen it where you have these big, beautiful Japanese maples, and, you know, there was one in particular that I took care of that I loved, and it had a big, you know, double trunk, and one half of it just didn't even leaf out. It was beautiful because I know because I took care of it, and over the winter, and you cut the trunk and you see the telltale black streaking and it was verticillium wilt that killed it. And we tried very hard to save the other side. But, you know. Yeah, and I'd say consider getting a soil test to find out if there's nutrients that you need, make sure the tree is mulched. But you definitely want to make sure there's enough water this fall that gets down in the ground that 18 to 24 inches so the tree can set buds for next year. And then what you need to do is put in an order that we don't have uh, March with 85 degrees yeah, right, followed right. by freezing temperatures I in April. Know. That hurt a lot of Japanese maples very badly. And how far out from the trunk would you, like if we were using a hose and just letting it go on our real slow? The water all the way around the tree, you want to go at least as far as your drip line, as far out as the branches stick. And if it goes beyond that, that's good. The, the drip line is an interesting place because when it rains, naturally water will cascade down and then drop. And so the tree takes advantage of that and it invests a lot of resources and roots where there's going to be water. So I mean it's a good spot to like, you know, make sure that you water from the drip line and it's just a... It's yeah, a, and water slowly, especially right. if you have heavier soils. So if it's a sandy soil, you know, I've got sandy soil, I can turn that hose on as hard as I want to run it, it soaks right in. If you have clay soils, you've got to be much more careful. Because sandy soils, by the shape of the particles, allows the water to drop down very rapidly. If you have clay, it's going to go sideways before it goes down. Now, a, a good rule of thumb before you plant a tree, you know, a soil test will give you a lot of information. But if you want to know how well drained the area is, you can dig a test pit. And uh, if you suspect that it's a wet area, you definitely don't want to plant an evergreen or, or some uh, tree species that is uh, susceptible to root rotting. Um, and what you do is you dig a, a hole about the size of that you would plant a ball, fill it up with water, let it drain, and then you come back to that hole, you fill it up again, and then you get your stopwatch ready and you go. And then you time how long it takes to drain. And some of them you need a grandfather clock. That's how slowly they drain. Right. And if, and if you need a grandfather clock to tell the time, uh, then it's probably not a well-drained area. And you should think about planting a, a willow or something. <laughs> <laughs> so you're looking at you're looking at a hole that's going to be 18 to 24 inches deep. When you're going to plant that tree, it should be twice as wide as the ball. It's just like the old timer said, you dig a dollar hole for a 50 cent tree. So you make it bigger. And then like you said, put the water in there and then when you do that second time, you're going to find out how well.